So thank you everyone for joining. And uh, we are having this Severo uh, Ochoa talk by Professor Moritz uh, Schwind. Uh, Moritz is a professor of computational design at the Nuremberg University of Applied Sciences uh, and um, also coordinator director of a new master's degree in Nuremberg Tech, focusing on emerging technologies and their effects and applications on design. Uh, he has also been a lecturer and presenter at various workshops and um, conferences such as OFF, FMX, uh, Everything Procedural, Movo, and others. And uh, he also has an extensive career in VFX and computer graphics. He has created a uh, very amazing uh, artwork. And his areas of research include generative design, AI-assisted design, and data-driven computer graphics. And he's also the co-founder of the educational uh, website called Entagma that focuses on generative art and design in the software side effects Houdini. Um, and Entagma focuses especially in video tutorials and uh, education of uh, on advanced procedural techniques. Moritz was a Severo Ochoa visitor during the last two weeks of August, and he, we had the pleasure of working with him. Uh, and we worked uh, on the field of explainable AI with a focus on novel ways of exploring and interacting with the latent space of generative models for uh, image and uh, uh, generative models of um, basically uh, images. And um, we explored uh, this, um, um, this part of explainable AI uh, trying to find novel ways or to explore novel ways of uh, enhancing the interactivity with such models, uh, especially with uh, an eye on non-technical users or and artists and designers. So with that, I leave you with Moritz. Thank you so much for that quite impressive introduction. Um, can't believe that this is everything we did and um, I'm feeling very happy and very privileged to be working with you guys together on this. Um, this talk um, is going to be a bit from the design-centric side. So if you have the feeling that it's a bit light on the math or actual comp sci, um, side, um, that's a deliberate decision. Um, however, um, if you have any questions or any remarks, um, if you want to just be plainly yell at me, uh, I'm very happy for a short Q&A after. With that being said, um, I called this one and you can see my screen that's shared and um, you can see that? Yep. Okay, so the, my main screen. Okay, perfect. So. I call this one prompting ISO 2023, researching new interfaces for AI, um, or what might or might uh, not make it into MLOps. MLOps is a framework for side effects of Houdini, again, generative software with a focus on generative AI. Um, so yeah, this talk is on AI, and usually the reaction I get from designers at this point is this one. However, um, hold your horses, this is also about creativity, and that is nice. Um, you already had a really brief introduction. That is just me, and that's the image that I like to convey of myself, giving really uh, important lectures in front of a really intrigued audience, while also being a professor in Germany is just being a human flag, keeping the eye out of the team of admissions while it's presenting. Before we start disclaimer, um, the usual disclaimers apply. We are white middle-aged folks. What might have worked uh, have worked for us, might have just been dumb luck, although we try to exclude it and filter it. And what I'm saying might just be stupid, dumb, or naive, and I'm very happy to discuss after. Please fight me. And also, research is hard. So before we get into the main focus of um, our research, let's talk a bit about the type of creativity, because that is kind of important, especially when I introduce this topic to um, uh, designers that I know because they always feel extremely threatened by AI, at least in parts. So um, this is from Margaret Bowden, um, one of the better known, more seasoned researchers into human and machine creativity. And she lists specifically three different types of creativity. One is combinatorial creativity. So creating unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. For example, a classic example would be this collage by Kurt Schwitters, Das Unbild, the Unimage where we um, take um, known concepts we are comfortable with them and uh, recreate them into something new, from something new that elevates the previous underlying work. Also, there's transformational creativity, where we transform conceptual spaces. One classic example would be for 
Pointillism, in this um, case, Poissignac, the breakfast, where you uh, take a conceptual space, a painting of a situation, and elevate it through a new technique and also through a new artistic expression via this technique. And finally, um, the, the type of creativity that I think we are working mainly on is exploratory creativity, exploring new conceptual spaces. And that is something that has only been partially done with AI, as I think AI, at least in my mind, is a wholly new medium and what happens with new media when they appear is they try to emulate and imitate media that have been previously existing. And that's what we're seeing, especially in concept art, in photography, um, in CG. We are trying to recreate an artistic expression that's been before. However, what happens if we explore those spaces? In this case, I just um, randomly um, explore the spaces around the embeddings for an abstract NASA space sculpture. And arguably, that is nothing that you can apply directly in your commercial work, such as advertising or graphic design. However, I think in the long run, this has more benefits for the overall design space versus just trying to emulate what's been before. And my thesis here, or my hypothesis is, prompts are the worst for this. The example I usually give is, how do you explain what a Picasso is or what a Picasso embodies before Picasso was born and was famous? How do we do that? Because we're looking for this new expression in this new medium. And existing human language might not be the most appropriate type of input for that. So what are our goals here? And these are some of the images that we created uh, while I was in Barcelona. Just happy accidents, but we want to make it more of a deliberate process of getting there. So it's these type of images that, again, from a commercial standpoint, um, they might only have a certain value. It's definitely nothing that your typical um, sportswear advertiser or car manufacturer um, would look for when they are briefing you for a new advertising campaign. But it's a new form um, of artistic expression that might be hard to describe with human words. At this point, I usually ask uh, my audience to raise their hands if they um, are already um, comfortable or if they know their diffusion-based neural networks. I mean, I'm seeing four people now out of you four, I'll at least know that two of you know your diffusion-based neural networks. So maybe show of hands, just give me a thumbs up or um, an icon so I can see if any one of you has ever worked with or has deeper experience with um, generative neural nets. So just for me to know how deep I should go into the next few slides. So if anyone has already worked with those types of networks or tinkered with them, just give me a thumbs up. If not, I'm happy to go deeper. Okay, one, Nabis, that's good and a few other ones I know here. Okay, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, Diffusion-based neural nets in two minutes. Diffusion-based neural nets are still the main network that we use today when it comes to creating images. So your DALI, stable diffusion, or mid-journey um, are based on this underlying techniques. And first, let's look a bit at the base data here. So most of these networks have been trained on a data set called LION5B, or derivatives of that. And um, this data set comes with a bunch of problems. And to illustrate one of those problems, I phrase it this way. The data set claims that men are ugly and the data proves it, and I can prove it. So let's have a look at the data set and explore it. I use just a search engine that goes through the data set and I search for women. The data has been tagged by humans and machines. And also each image in here contains a description of the image as well as an aesthetic score. I think it goes from one to 10 or from zero to nine. Not sure again, but this is what comes out for women with an aesthetic score of zero. And that is not surprising. You see that all over the data set. You see those placeholder images um, that come from your image libraries. And clearly those are just placeholders and they have nothing um, to do with the concept you're looking for. So clearly these stock photography placeholders are non-aesthetic images of women. So let's increase the aesthetic rating to, in this case, three. And already we are seeing biases. We are seeing predominantly Caucasian Predominantly slender, athletic, symmetric, under 40 images of females. So already a very narrow image of what the concept of a woman in the world means. And if we increase this even further to 9, to the highest aesthetic rating, it gets really troubling. Where you have these doll-like images of extremely young women, um, where you're al um, al almost getting a uh, caricature of what a woman or a model is. So that's your woman. I claimed men are ugly and the data proves it. So let's do the same thing and prompt or look, search for men. Men with an aesthetic rating of zero. Again, 
almost exclusively um, placeholder images from stock databases. Nothing surprising here. So let's incre uh, increase the aesthetic rating to three in this case. And slowly we see a few dudes in business attire. Again, very symmetric, rather young, um, rather slender, rather Caucasian, and rather businessy. So let's increase the aesthetic rating even more to seven. And we see a hipster beard here or there or a t-shirt um, with a slightly toned body appearing here. Again, still very Caucasian, still very um, slender, um, still very young. Now, my point is men are ugly. Why am I claiming this? Let's have a look at men with an aesthetic rating of nine. So the most aesthetically pleasing idea of a man. And that's this, gingerbread man and teddy bear. So where does this come from? I have a hypothesis. Again, nothing to prove it, but my gut feeling is that the original um, human evaluated aesthetic score has been predominantly done by your average internet user, which still is your Caucasian, cis, um, heterosexual male. And they might be hesitant to admit that they find a fellow male person or the image of a fellow male person extremely aesthetically pleasing. But that's just my theory. And that's why you have in the data the most aesthetically pleasing concept of a man is a gingerbread man and teddy bear. So whatever you use, be aware that there's huge biases in the data, um, which we can also sometimes use for our advantage, but more on that later. Now, for the technique, this is your simple uh, prom, uh, your simple block diagram. So you start out with a prompt. In this case, a parrot wearing a tuxedo. That's the image I want to generate. This first gets tokenized. Um, so what we're doing here is we um, cut up this sentence, a parrot wearing a tuxedo, into um, numbers. And these numbers are just looked up by a dictionary. In this case, these are um, the actual numbers that come out of this prompt. There's just a start and an end um, index here, the 49406 and 49407. And in between, you have these codes for either words or parts of words. And these then get fed into a text encoder. And this text encoder generates a list of numbers, a so-called vector, usually high dimensional. That means a list of numbers, typically between somewhere between 700 and 77,000, sometimes more components. And then we need noise, which we feed in um, this network, which has been traditionally called a unit. There are newer architectures out there. And this network tries to remove this noise in the originally garbled up image step by step while taking info from this vector here and trying to denoise it in a way that it resembles a parrot wearing a tuxedo. And if you do this over and over again and remove a bit of noise per step again and try removing it in a way that it resembles a parrot with a tuxedo, at the end you get this, the image of a parrot wearing a, tux a tuxedo. So that's roughly how most of these um, networks and most of these techniques still work and function. So how do you art direct this? Well, the canonical example, and just to start sim with a simple example, is we can do funny stuff like prompt arithmetic or math with words. So in this case, we want to try to, from king, subtract man and add woman to it. So this is what happens when I try to generate an image of a king. This is your concept of a man. This is the concept of a woman. And that's what comes out when you do king minus man plus woman. So compare it and you've got arguably your queen. And that's the canonical example that you find in many papers. Quite boring. What happens when I try doing something like this? And I was worried about the outcome of this. So I expected some really weird off-putting images. Um, again, keeping in mind those biases in the data set. However, what happened is I arrived at this here. So this kind of hauntingly beautiful, partially abstract world between painting, photography, and sometimes gobbled up 3D art, which I find really beautiful from a design and artistic standpoint. And the question is, how can we reliably get there? Or how can we even um, explore unknown worlds that these models have learned in their data set that allow us to deliberately and more easily get to these kind of worlds? How do we art direct? So let's have a look at these high dimensional vectors I've been talking about. And again, apologies to the more math-centered folks in here. Again, this is a talk that was geared towards artists. Um, I'm giving an oversimplification, but I think it's a good mental image of what happens. So let's try visualizing these high-dimensional vector spaces. And let's just imagine them as a flat two-dimensional map. And this is the map that our model learned of the world it exists within, the world it knows from the data set. 
In this case, down here, there might be a few data points. And if we run them through our neural network, it generates an image. Down here, this point would generate a parrot image. Up here, for example, this is an island that would generate images of tuxedos. And next to it, a peninsula of points that would generate something like this. Anyone has got a solid idea why this is there? I usually hear two um, theories. The theory I hear is just because a penguin looks very much like a tuxedo. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, that's one argument. But I think this comes more from the fact that um, the Linux icon is called tux. So it semantically classes it up there. And then the noise that we are starting with when it comes from denoising our image and generating a new image is, in this case, let's just imagine it as picking a random point on our map. And then this multidimensional vector we can see as a direction that we tell this point or that we tell the algorithm to explore our map into to, after a few steps, arrive at the image of a parrot wearing a tuxedo. So that's in two dimensions. And now you just imagine an additional 77,000 or so dimensions and you've got your whole embedding space. That's what this thing is called, visualized. And what we can actually do, we can employ dimensionality reduction techniques such as um, PCA, TISNI, or in our case, UMAP, to actually visualize the space in two dimensions. And what I visualized here is a prompt blending between a tuxedo, a parrot, and a parrot wearing a tuxedo. So you can see really this horseshoe round trip in embedding space. This here is the visualization of a blending between pizza and a parrot. So you can see if you zoom out a bit, this is just like where it gets from pizza to parrot. You can nicely see the island of pizzas clustered down there and up there. You've got your parrots. Just to drive this home again, initially meant for designers, latent space, for example, when digits, this is your MNIST data set. So a data set of handwritten digits projected down to three-dimensional uh, embedding space. So you can now see A, the clustering of those individual handwritten digits, but also how you can seamlessly blend between those individual digits. So basically your embedding space is a highly compressed representation of concepts that exist there. So where do the uh, these things come in? Again, it's here in the tokenizer and text encoder where they get generated. And what I can do now is directly influence this direction. Influencing a direction in 77,000 dimensions as with stable diffusion 1.5 is a bit difficult. So let's start off with something really naive and just to pick one point that in this case generates a parrot and then do a drunken person's walk and just randomly scatter a few points around there and turn those points into images. So what we can then witness is the further we get away from the central point, at first the concept of a parrot holds up and even yields sometimes um, amazingly beautiful images. But the further we get away from the central point, the more we diverge into weird images that just hold up the concepts of what a parrot is until after a few um, steps in our walk, we arrive at this, a parrot-shaped noise, if you want. Diving deeper, let's look at one very specific component, namely the tokenizer. The tokenizer, as I mentioned, is just a dictionary. And you can see what this dictionary looks like here. You can see those individual word snippets or sometimes even just letters with their IDs next to it. And we just go through our prompt and cut, try cutting up this input prompt into these snippets. So why are tokens important? Let's assume you want to add a new um, concept to a neural network. For example, my face. What token do you... Um, associate with this dude here. It's best to use something that is not taken yet because then we don't overwrite any concepts. We don't have to train out any pre-existing concepts. And in theory, our training should work a bit more reliably. And historically, when this technique called Dream Booth um, was pioneered first, people settled on the token SKS. And that looked like it would work. So instead of Moritz Schwind or a man wearing a hat, you would prompt for SKS after training. However, after a few weeks, it became apparent that SKS tended to generate this. This is a Russian assault rifle called SKS. So nowadays, instead of using SKS, people tend to use ZKZ, and that seems to work. However, what if we explore this a bit more systematically? So let's try kind of filtering and see what 
pre-existing biases or pre-existing concepts in our neural networks exist for those individual tokens by, in our case, limiting ourselves to three and four letter tokens. And then for each of those tokens, which I think are 6,300 that are left, generate a batch of images, 40 images, and not only um, auto-tag them, so we get a human readable description of what's happening in those images, but also within those 40 images for one token, evaluate how similar or how dissimilar the images are. In theory, that should give us um, how strong or how weak a concept for a given token is. And again, tagging those images and evaluating the similarity. For example, this CAMO, C-A-M-O, was one of the tokens with the highest self-similarity. And then we can evaluate um, how strong or how weak concepts, concepts are. Again, in stable diffusion, bees is a very strong concept or mall, while wit, um, I think this is wit too, is a rather diverse concept. And then we can try fine tuning a network. And so far, um, I only did a handful of tests. Um, and so far, the hypothesis that a token with a weaker prior um, should train better or more, um, the training should converge faster, didn't hold up so far. But we can use this data to do something different, to translate human to token. For example, the concept of an elderly red-haired woman wearing glasses and having curly hair is a rather long prompt to describe. However, there's a four-letter token that describes this, and it's called Barb, B-A-R-B. Or this young, blonde, red-haired man, teenager, this is Isaac, I-S-A-K. And we also can, can um, predict or can tell something about the biases that a world model has. For example, when you're prompting for Eno, I was fully expecting this guy. This is Brian Eno, prog rock musician, uh, very well known. I think he did the Windows um, XP or Windows 95 startup sound. However, when you prompt the model for Eno, you get this. And a quick Google search reveals that one of the major manufacturers of hammocks has a rather popular model called Eno. Or the same with the German word for mouth, for animal snout, Maul. Of course, this is all Star Wars, Darth Maul. So again, while not confirming the original hypothesis, we have now a data set that we can at least use to explore this. But let's kind of build on this a bit more systematically. Um, and I held off on, on building a rather comprehensive atlas because I didn't have the resources, basically. And then this happened. You got in touch with me and contacted me. And at this point, I think I don't need to introduce you folks to yourself and you also know your portfolio quite well and you know this and this and this. So at this point, the question changed from can we just probe a um, system to can we build a more comprehensive atlas and preferably in a, a more modern AI network called Flux. Basically, can we generate an atlas that maps out this embedding space to 3D then pick a random point in 3D, even where we have no data already, and from this point, infer our embedding. So infer a high-dimensional vector, which we can then use to generate an image out of it. So basically what we want to do is we want to go prompt, embedding, 3D coordinate, and then back from a 3D coordinate to an embedding to an image. Sounds easy, right? Well, so here's your standard stable diffusion text embeddings, those vectors that I've talked about, those 77,000 dimensions. And I've drawn them to scale. So think of this as this vector, just the numbers. Each pixel is a number here. Turns out Flux uses T5 and Clip. And actually the T5 is the orange part. And at the bottom of the orange part, there's like a third. There's one single line of blue pixels. That is the Clip component, the 768 components. This is an issue because this takes resources and time to UMAP to dimensionality reduce. And what happens after uh, days and weeks of uh, calculating, it turns out that this is taking longer than expected. And this was like, I think, a day or two um, before I wanted to originally represent this thing. So at this point, you're pondering your life choices. And again, this was Monday night, and I think Tuesday evening I had to present. So you panic and reread the paper. And it turns out that in the Flux paper, on the very last or second to last page, you find this. We find that removing T5 at inference time still achieves competitive performance. 
and nice. Basically, just this single blue line down there is what matters for the concept to, to be interpreted realistically and not this orange stuff. So let's test this out. And here I prompted for a cat holding a balloon. The left one is with the T5 and the clip embeddings, and the right one is the clip embeddings only. And while it's clearly a different image, the concept still holds up. And we're super happy because now we can only work with um, vectors that have, have 768 numbers in them versus 2 million numbers. And what we can crank out of this is this. This is a three-dimensional point cloud of, in this case, a quarter million um, words that we prompted, just an English dictionary from NLTK. And if you zoom in here, and I, tell, I, I kid you not, this was by accident where I zoomed in here. I zoomed into the weed and cannabis cluster here. But you can see it's uh, working. So legalization and weed and cannabis is in the same cluster. So the dimensionality reduction in this case really holds up. Or when we zoom at another cluster here, we can see this is everything with books. To give you more examples here, we have the cluster for dog. And if you zoom out, you can first find different breeds of dogs, corgi, dachshund. hound. Um, I think a schnauzer is in there somewhere. And if you zoom out further, you get more animals here with rabbits and snakes and um, I think whales are somewhere. So prompt, embedding, three-dimensional map, that works. How do we go back? Imagine we just create a new point somewhere in there and want to generate this into an image. So we need to go back from this 3D coordinate into an embedding. How do we do that? Well, there's one technique called UMAP inversion. A bit costly, but hey, let's use it. So taking this image or the embedding that results in this image, mapping it to 3D, and from this generating a new embedding and from this generating a new image. If everything would work perfect in a perfect world, the exact same image should come out here. Yeah, close, but not exactly. Well, you got at least two people there, one arguably male, one arguably female, but the rest doesn't hold up so well in composition and pose and cropping. Let's try this one. Also doesn't hold up too well. And this guy here becomes a kangaroo dog, so meh. Let's try something different. And instead of reversing UMAP, which is also quite computationally costly, let's just interpolate. Take the n nearest points and from those interpolate the underlying embeddings using radial basis function interpolating. So again, let's try it, interpolate back and generate an image out of it. Again, should in theory, if the world would be perfect, be the same image, but it's closer. It's closer than the previous one. This one, well, while not perfect, arguably closer. And our kangaroo guy is at least now a dog guy that is sitting there in a really similar pose. Good enough for me. And all of this has been tested in Stable Diffusion 1.5. So really old model, old, that means like two, three years by now, but really fast. But we wanted to go to Flux. So let's try that as well. Again, embedding that created this image, map it to 3D, map it back to the embedding, create an image out of this. While not exactly the same thing, still the concepts of berries or grapes being positioned in a photo holds up. Same thing with this ornament. That also gets reproduced. And sometimes it doesn't work too correctly, but still the concept of sci-fi aggressive heroish is still existing. Nice enough for me. However, Flux is big. Not big for super computational, but big for your average designer, laptop, or um, workstation that we have here. And that's mainly our audience. That's the folks we want to enable to explore this. And in order to get around there with this, there exist quantized models that now fit in high-end um, gamer graphics cards as VRAM. So let's do the same thing, the same test with the quantized flux model. Again, this is the original image, then mapping it to, uh, to 3D, going back to embeddings and regenerating that image. Should yield a similar image, right? Okay, let's try this and this. And I literally did a difference between those. These images are pixel perfect. And if you're like me, at this point, you're fuck. There must be a mistake in the code. This is by, there is an error. There's a slight error in the embedding that we regenerate. It still yields the same image. What's going on? 
after the panic settled down, I thought a bit about what quantization actually is. So quantization is a really nice technique to prevent your graphics card's RAM from overflowing. So to fit a model that is too big into your 16 or 24 gigabytes of your GeForce graphics card. And the question or the idea is how, do precise, how precise do we actually need to be? How finely do we have to save those vector directions in embedding space where we walk around that land, uh, that, that map? And the idea is, well, you can really finally um, resolve a number, in this case, 0 to 1 in 32 steps, or you can save that same number using a, a few bits less and only have four discrete steps how to save these numbers, which is fine. It saves you lots of memory. However, what happens with those fine individual directional jitters that you have in the space where your vector doesn't point exactly in that direction, but just a tiny bit off. What happens here? Well, the same number just gets mapped to zero. So instead of being able to save all these numbers here individually, they all amount to the same, to the same number, zero. And that's what happens here in this quantized model. Even although I have a small error, the error doesn't show up because the model is too causally resolved to even care about it. I'm not sure about you, but I'd say nice. So now, where do we go from here? Well, first off, uh, Mata ran a few batches of Flux images and we picked out um, a few images that show what's going on in Flux because with every model, and those models also can be community trained. So usually what happens is the base models get used and abused by the community, fine-tuned for um, certain applications, for example, photo reel, or let's call it certain art styles. Um, have a look at Civit AI if you're interested, and you have to have really rough cornea, and you have to be able to endure a lot. But this is your vanilla flux. So we see this often. Red-ish caped, reddish colored superheroes. For some reason, flux likes to produce these, especially with more ambiguous words. Same thing for these orangey, reddish CG toys. And of course, Flux, same as Stable Diffusion or most community trained models I've seen so far, has a very healthy body image of what the concept of male and female looks. That makes you sometimes feel like the guy in the bottom right corner. So next steps. Um, we're looking to build, uh, visualize, and analyze more comprehensive data set. So while feeding a, sim a single dictionary um, tells you already something about the models, what about combinations of adjectives and nouns? What about simple proto-sentences, three-letter, sen uh, three-word sentences? Can we gain more insight into what a model does and how this maps into three-dimensional space? So what's the tools you use for this? Well, of course you, and sometimes I through you, have access to this brilliant thing. But again, um, I try to communicate this to students, to other designers, and I wanna encourage them to also try this. Um, and you can make do with these wonky contraptions and you sometimes don't even need those. That's just my own personal, I call it cluster, but literally it's a gaming PC where I slammed on six G-forces. Um, and that works. It sits in a corner, uh, blasting away, um, just calculating embeddings and calculating images. That works. What's also really handy with those contraptions is something like a Pi KVM. That's a remote access solution. It's literally just a Raspberry Pi with an HDMI grabber that allows you to remotely um, not only log into the computer and control it, but also it has a small um, connector where it hooks to the motherboard of the computer. So you can just literally hardware switch it on and off. So if you don't want to invest in server hardware, being able to do that, and if your IT actually allows you to do that, or if you wiggle your way around, really this. But of course, it is not about the tools. It's about the people you work with. So infam uh, infamous last words, learnings. Check your data. Um, for example, Marta and I, um, we've been feeding just words into this whole thing, and we just assumed that a list of words is a list of words. It turns out the brown corpus is just a collection of articles. So there is um, single words occurring there multiple times. So check your data. Just give your data a list to look through. And also read your papers multiple times when you're uh, panicking. Sometimes there's these nuggets in there that allow you to really speed up um, your whole calculations. 
then again, this is really important to me. Um, that's what I try to communicate to my students and to folks I meet um, and I collaborate with. I regard AI as a new medium. I think we should treat it as such. Otherwise, we underestimate it and we treat it wrongly. Of course, it can emulate previous media and it can do that um, with advantages and disadvantages. But um, I think um, we are not leveraging its potential if we just try to imitate. Research is hard and frustrating. Um, and sometimes, and I'm sorry, I didn't want to put Marta on the spot here. Um, this is just um, the same as I felt. Um, sometimes you're insecure about everything and you question everything. But also, research is rewarding once you find out something. And also, the collaboration is extremely rewarding. And finally, research is fun. The people you meet, the places you see, the discoveries you make. So, next steps for us, you mapping bigger atlases, generating larger image data sets, and then building a UI. So making this explorable um, in an interactive manner to um, non-specialists, designers, um, to be able to work with this interactively, which has a bunch of problems that we still need to solve. Um, I'm happy to discuss them. I'm happy to take your input on them um, and maybe get this into Side Effects Houdini as well. And then if someone of you happens to still want to do a master's degree and can stand this dude here, we've got a master's program. Uh, next application season will be in, I think, May 2025. It's called the Design for Digital Futures, focuses on generative um, design, um, AI, and design research. And that is not quite my 45 minutes. So I'm open for questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Moritz. Pleasure. Uh, great talk. Uh, so Thank you.